Good morning. Uh, thanks for coming out so early. Uh, welcome to HTTP Decent Attacks, smashing into the cell next door. Have you ever seen a system that was so complex it just had to be vulnerable? These days, we rely on layer upon layer of abstraction to have the faintest understanding of how a website really works. And we tell people things like, HTTP is stateless, and you send one request, you get one response. But what if both of those were just kind of wrong? In this session, I'm going to share with you new tools and techniques to desynchronize complex systems, smash through the barriers around HTTP requests, and make websites rain exploits on their visitors. During some research last year, I came up with a theory, which was if you're trying to select a topic to research, then the best topic is the one that makes you the most nervous. And this year I thought, okay, I'm going to try this theory out. So I asked myself, what topic am I personally really scared of trying out? And the answer was HTTP request smuggling. I saw a presentation on this called Hiding Rookies in HTTP three years ago at DEF CON. And it was a thrilling presentation, but it also left me kind of too nervous to tackle this topic myself. One reason is that this technique was first documented way back in 2005, and yet I'd never seen it successfully used on a real website. Another is that my technical understanding just wasn't there, so some of the diagrams made absolutely no sense to me. And also, there were some kind of worrying statements on some of the slides. One of them said, you will not earn bounties using this technique. And another said, you will certainly not be considered like a white hat if you even try and find out if a live website is vulnerable because this technique is so dangerous. And at the time, I thought, okay, I'm just going to leave this well alone. But this year, to test my theory out, I decided to try this and see what happened. And, well, quite a few things happened. I did manage to earn some bounties, and nobody's called me a black hat for it so far, although one guy on Twitter did call me a terrorist. <laughs> uh, but I got quite a few interesting reactions off people. Quite a few people were surprised. Uh, one guy that I submitted a vulnerability to was so amazed by this, he concluded that I was faking the entire report in order to trick him into paying me a bounty. And at the other end of the spectrum, and uh, another guy liked the unique technique that I used on his website so much, he thought he'd take that technique for himself and, and use it to make himself some bug bounty money in his spare time behind my back. Uh, of course, I had no idea he was doing this. He didn't tell me until... He ran into some technical problems with the technique, because it's not the easiest thing in the world, and decided that the best solution to these was to pretend to be someone else and then email me asking for help with it, which didn't work out very well for him. Uh, but out of all of this chaos, I've been able to bring you safe detection methods that will let you find this vulnerability without being called a black hat, all new methods to trigger desynchronization and exploit the results, and methodology and tooling to bring clarity to a topic that's been overlooked for far too long. So, first I'm going to talk about what makes this attack possible, uh, how to assess if a given target is vulnerable and what to do next. After that, I'll take a look at how we can exploit it, demonstrated using case studies on real websites, starting out simple and then building in complexity and ending with a live demo in which I'll also show how to use the free open source tool that I'm releasing as part of this research. After that, I'll talk about defense a bit and then wrap up and answer some questions at the back. So, if you picture a website as an end user, it probably looks something like this, because as an end user, that's all that we can directly see. But behind the scenes, most modern websites are routing requests through a chain of web servers speaking to each other over HTTP, over a stream-based transport layer protocol like TCP or TLS. And for the sake of performance, these streams are heavily reused following the HTTP 1.1 Keep Alive protocol, which simply means the HTTP requests are placed back to back on the stream with no delimiters in between them. And every server in the chain is expected to parse the HTTP headers to work out where each message stops and the next one starts. So we have requests from users all around the world being funneled through these tiny pools of backend streams to the application server 
sitting at the back. It's pretty obvious what's going to go wrong here, right? What happens if, as an attacker, we send an ambiguous message, one that gets parsed differently by the front end and the back end, leading to the front end and the back end thinking that this message is a different length? Take this blob of blue and orange data here. The front end views this as one request, so it's forwarding the whole thing immediately onto the back end. But when the back end reassembles it and parses those headers, for some reason, it thinks this message is shorter, and it thinks it ends with the final blue square. So it thinks the orange square is the start of the next message. And it's going to wait for that phantom second message to be completed until someone else sends a request to that website, at which point theirs will get concatenated onto the end of it. And that is the essence of, of request smuggling, where you can effectively apply an arbitrary prefix to the second request to hit the server. Now, because we can't directly see what's happening behind the front end, it's quite easy to get bogged down in the technical details here. I certainly did myself, but throughout the presentation, please remember, it's really just that simple. Now, let's zoom in and see what the data looks like on the wire. So, this attack is ambiguous because we're using an absolutely classic desynchronization technique, which is that we've simply specified the content length header twice. So in this example, the front end server has looked at the first content length header. It's, so it's forwarded all the blue data and the orange G onto the back end. But the back end has looked at the second content length header. It's only read in the blue data. It thinks the G is the start of the next message. So when an actual second message turns up, whoever that user is, is going to get an un a response saying something like, unknown method G post. And that's it. We've successfully done a request smuggling attack. The only catch is this technique is so classic that it doesn't really work on anything that's actually worth hacking these days. What does work on plenty of interesting systems is using chunked encoding. Uh, chunked encoding is an alternative to using the content length, whereby instead of specifying the length of the message up front, the server that receives it is expected to parse the body of the message until it reaches a zero followed by an empty line. So this is pretty much exactly the same as the previous technique. The front end here is looking at the content length and forwarding the blue and orange data, and the back end is, thinks this message is chunked. It's reading in the blue data when it sees the zero followed by a new line. It stops parsing that message, and it once again, the victim gets a message saying something like, unknown method G post. Now, the key difference with this technique is that it actually works on plenty of real systems. But what if the desynchronization happens the other way around? What if it's the front end that looks at the transfer encoding header and the back end that looks at the content length? Well, we can still exploit that. We just have to reformat our, our request slightly. And we have this minor limitation, which is that the malicious prefix, which is shown in orange, has to end with a zero followed by a blank line. But in general, that's not going to cause us any problems. Now, if you're looking at the content length, in that request. You might be wondering why it's three when there's only one obvious byte of data in the request. That's because every line in pretty much every message here ends with a slash r slash n. That's just the normal line ending, and it's not shown on the slides to keep them reasonably clear. So why does that chunk technique work on so many systems? Well, I think we've got to give some credit to the specification. RFC 2616 says you should, if you get a message that uses transfer encoding chunked and a content length, you should give priority to the chunked header. And that kind of is taken to implicitly say that these messages are acceptable and you shouldn't just be rejecting them outright with a bad, with a bad request message or something like that. And so all you need in a chain of web servers is one server that doesn't support chunked encoding, and that will fall back to using the content length, and you'll be able to, to desynchronize them. So that technique, by itself, lets you desynchronize and do request smuggling on tons of systems, including, at the time I found it, pretty much every single website using the content delivery network, Akamai. Akamai have now patched this last week, uh, so it, it now doesn't work on all Akamai systems, but it does still work on some of them. Now, what if you want to desynchronize a website and all the servers in the chain do support 
chunked in coding. Well, chances are you still can, you're just going to have to work slightly harder. What you need to do is find a way to hide the transfer encoding chunked header from one server in the chain. And there's tons of ways of doing that. For example, some servers trim trailing white space in, in header names, whereas others don't. So some will think a message with that header is chunked, and others will think it's not chunked and fall back to using the content length. Other systems <laughs> simply grep the transfer encoding header for the word chunked rather than tokenizing it, so they will think that that message is chunked and others won't, and so on. And there's loads of techniques that you can use to desynchronize systems. This is just a tiny sampling of them, but every technique shown on this slide is one that I've successfully used on a real system during this research. Uh, and the ones highlighted in orange are those that I came up with myself that I don't think have been documented anywhere else. So, at this point, we understand the fundamentals of how to desynchronize servers. And that is a really powerful building block. But if we just try and whack a server with this building block, I can tell you with confidence that you'll run into hazards and complications and end up wasting loads of time. So, to avoid that, I've developed this methodology to guide us in a controlled manner, step by step, towards a successful exploit. First off, we need to detect when desynchronization is possible. The obvious approach to doing this is to send a payload designed to poison the backend system right, with a malicious prefix as shown in orange earlier, and then send a second request and see if the response to that message looks like it's been poisoned. But there's a massive flaw with this technique, which is that if anyone else's request hits the server in, in between your two, they'll get the poisoned response, they'll have a bad day, and you won't find the vulnerability, you'll get a false negative. So we need a better way that's actually reliable. And after quite a lot of effort, I've got one here. So how this, how this request gets processed depends heavily on the configuration of the front end and the back end. If the front end and the back end both look at the content length, the whole thing will get forwarded on to the back end and responded to immediately, everything's fine. If the front end looks at the transfer encoding chunked header, then it will pass the first chunk size, which is three. It will read in the ABC, and then it will try to pass the next chunk size, which is Q. And the chunk size is meant to be hexadecimal, so that Q is not valid, and this message will just get rejected immediately by the front end, and it will never even reach the back end server. But if the front end server looks at the content length, it will forward the blue data, but not the orange Q. And that means that if the back end receives that, and treats this message as being chunked, it will time out while waiting for the rest of the mess, for the next chunk size to turn up. So if you send this request and you get a chunk and you get a timeout, that's a strong indication that this server is probably vulnerable to desynchronization. I'm just gonna move this mic slightly. Right, hopefully that's gonna be less noisy. Can everyone still hear me? Cool, great. So, uh, well, yeah, what if the server is vulnerable the other way around? Well, we can still d d detect that using a similar technique, uh, but there is a minor catch, which is that if the server is vulnerable the first way around, then we end up accidentally poisoning the backend socket with this X, and we're potentially going to screw up some real user that's browsing the site. So, with this strategy, it's important to always try the technique on the left first to make sure that you don't do any harm. But as long as you stick to that, trying out these techniques on live websites is more or less completely safe and should definitely theoretically have no repercussions on real users. <laughs> now, this technique should be tried on every single URL on the, on the target website because websites often route requests to different URLs to different backend servers and you can't always visibly tell when that's happening. And to help you out with that, obviously that will be pretty tedious, uh, I've released an open source tool, which is a Burp Suite extension, which works with the free version of Burp and will, and, and will automatically try out that technique for you. And it will, it will try, out with all the, try it out with all the different desynchronization techniques that I showed you on the previous slide, as we'll see later. Now, because this technique is reliant on a kind of inference to find the vulnerability, it does get a small number of false positives, but 
it doesn't get many, and the real strength is that you'll get vastly less false negatives. For example, on one particular target that I found, this technique found the vulnerability every single time, whereas with the classic technique where you send two, <laughs> two requests, I had 800 failed attempts before it worked, and that's probably 800 real users that got junk responses. So in an ideal world, you could probably stop there and report that, but in reality, most clients probably won't take that report seriously. They'll want more evidence that their server is really vulnerable. So now we're going to have to switch back to using this, uh, this technique where you send a pair, a pair of requests. So the, the first one should try and poison the backend socket so that the subsequent, so the second request, shown in green, should get a different <laughs> response code if the system is really vulnerable. Uh, please remember you'll need to try this multiple times if the website is getting traffic from, from anybody else. And even if it isn't, many websites still use a pool of connections to the back end. So, so, so you'll still need to try it multiple times. Uh, and yes, sometimes you will need to try it 800 times. Now, it's really important that, that the blue and orange attack and the green follow-up are not sent over the same connection because if you do that you'll get false positives and the other key thing is that the endpoint that you send uh, the blue and orange request to is really important because if the back-end server doesn't like your message maybe because it's not ex expected to get a, a, a post request then it may reject it and when it rejects it it will typically close the connection which will lead to the orange data being thrown out and the attack failing. So you ideally want to target a to target an endpoint that expects to get a, a, a post request and try and preserve any CSERF tokens and such like that it might be expecting as well. Okay, now we're finally done with the theory. We can take a look at what damage we can do with this technique. So every every case study that I'm looking at here, I'm going to look at now, is a real system that I exploited during this research, uh, they all have bug bounty programs. Please don't exploit random websites. Uh, I've been forced to redact quite a few company names, unfortunately, uh, but I'd like to give a shout out to every company that actually let me name them. Please remember, these are the guys that are actually secure now. Uh, during this section, I'm also going to keep a running total of the bounties earned during this research. Uh, of these bounties, as usual, uh, we've spent 50% on beer as a company and donated the other 50% to local charities. Right, probably the easiest attack that you can do with request smuggling is bypassing security rules that have been implemented on the front end system. For example, on one well-known software vendor that I sadly can't name, they had their front end set up to block access to the URL slash admin. But by using uh, request smuggling, you can hide that URL from the front end system so when I send a second request to the server, the, the, the back end thinks I'm accessing the root of the server, but I actually get access to the admin page. So far, so easy. Now, lots of front ends like to rewrite requests by adding headers into them. And one header that practically every single website uses some variation of is x forwarded for, which just specifies the remote user's IP. On a well-configured system, if you specify that IP yourself directly in a normal request, the front end will rewrite that header or remove it entirely. So you can't just use it to spoof your IP. <laughs> but using request smuggling, we can bypass that rewriting because the front end doesn't see it as being part, as being a header, uh, and thereby spoof our IP. And using that technique, just by itself, I got an incredible $300 bounty. Uh, so I'm not suggesting you're going to get rich quick using this particular strategy, but it is worth knowing because it does work on pretty much every single target. And it also has a slightly less obvious use, which is imagine you have a target where the, de where the timing based technique suggests it's vulnerable, but this target gets loads of traffic. So you've effectively got zero chance of getting a poisoned response yourself. How do you prove that's really vulnerable? You've basically got a blind request smuggling vulnerability there. Well, one thing you can do is send a request something like this, but specify a unique host name in the exported for header. If you get a DNS lookup for that host header, uh, for the exported for header, then that proves 
that that survey is that the back end is parsing that as a separate message and thereby proves that that target is really vulnerable to request smuggling. <laughs> okay. Now, IP spoofing is okay, but a bit boring. The really interesting behavior is going to come from application specific headers. But how can you exploit an application if you don't know the value of these headers? Well, on most sites, you can basically ask the application. So here I'm targeting New, New Relic, who make analytical software stuff, uh, and I've smuggled a login request. And I've made sure that the email address that I'm trying to log in with is the last parameter. So that means when I send the next request, that effectively gets concatenated onto the email address that I'm trying to log in with. And then the server comes back and says, that's not a valid email address, and it, and it reflects the email address I've supplied, and that includes the whole of the, of the second request after it gets <laughs> been rewritten by the front-end system. So that effectively leaks all the headers that the front-end system is putting on to the request. And some of those headers are going to come in useful shortly. So on the new relic, their back-end system was actually a reverse proxy. So by changing the host header, I could get access to different internal systems. But initially, they all just came back with this boring redirect to HTTPS. But by looking at the previous slide, uh, we can see that they're using the X forwarded proto header. And by sticking that on the smuggled uh, request, I can tell the server, yep, yeah, I'm using HTTPS. You can trust this. And then we can actually access whatever that internal site is. So I went hunting for some interesting content uh, and found on a particular URL, we get this really taunting error message. It says not authorized with header. And then there's a colon, but then it doesn't tell me what the name of the header that I'm not authorized with is. So I thought, okay, maybe I could just flick back and try and leak the header. Uh, and I thought, okay, maybe it's this XNR external service header that we saw but that actually just makes the problem worse. And at this point, I could have used that technique that I just showed you on loads of different New Relic endpoints until I found the name of this authorization header. But I was getting kind of bored by this point, so instead I cheated and I consulted my notes from last time I compromised New Relic. <laughs> and that revealed the service gateway account ID and service gateway is New Relic admin headers. So using those by accessing a specific internal uh, API, I could access that API as every account on their system as an admin and basically take full control over everything. So I got a decent $3,000 bounty uh, for that and they patched that with a hot fix but they said that the root cause was their F5 load balancer uh, and I don't think that's been fixed. So if you see a system running F5, definitely try this technique out. Now, what we've seen here is with request smuggling, if you're willing to put a bunch of time in, you can often break directly into, in, into internal systems and have a good time. But there's often much easier techniques focused on attacking other users. For a start, if the application has any way of persistently storing text data, exploitation is really easy. So here I'm targeting uh, Trello, which is a note-taking application, and I've, I've smuggled a, a request that's saying, please update my public profile. And I'm going to send that and not send a follow-up, so someone else's request is going to get stuck on the end of it, and then, that, and then that effectively gets saved on my profile. So I can just browse to my profile and see the whole of, of this user's request, including their session cookies, regardless of whether they're secure and HTTP only, and just really easy easily hijack their account. So every time I send that payload, I hijack someone's account with no use of interaction whatsoever. Uh, I got a, a couple of bounties before that. Uh, on a different site, I found there was no obvious way of storing text data, but they had a support ticket system. So by making the victim's request land in a, a support ticket, uh, I couldn't log in and view that, but it got emailed to me later on, and I could hijack their account. <laughs> uh, the only limitation with this technique uh, is, is that you can only steal data up to the first ampersand in the victim's request, because everything after that is interpreted as being a separate parameter. So that means you sadly generally can't steal 
login requests to get people's usernames and passwords in uh, in plain text. Uh, the only exception to that is if the site is doing their login using a JSON request, then you can, uh, unless the victim has an ampersand in their password. <laughs> okay, so what if you can't store data? Well, there's a whole other branch of attacks based on causing victims to get harmful responses. So uh, here's, a, here's the most conceptually simple example. On this site, I found some reflected XSS. And reflected XSS is okay by itself, but it's not great for mass exploitation because it requires some kind of user interaction. The victim has to click a link I send them or something like that. But by smuggling the request to trigger the XSS, then some random other person browsing the site is, is going to get the harmful response and get exploited. Uh, the main advantage of this, other than it working, other than it not requiring user interaction, is that this technique works with traditionally unexploitable XSS vulnerabilities like XSS in the user agent header and <laughs> reflected XSS on post requests that have CSERF tokens and so on. Now, while testing one target, I happen to load their homepage in a web browser with the developer tools open. And this message popped up, which made me nervous because I recognized the IP in that message. And I got this message regardless of what browser I used to load their homepage and what device and what network I connected from. And it turned out, uh, yep, that was my fault. Uh, what I'd been doing was I was trying to trigger a redirect from the server. Uh, and I'd successfully found a prefix that caused the redirect, but someone else's request had snuck in there and they were trying to load this image, so they've received this redirect. By itself, you know, that's not ideal, but we, we've only annoyed one person. Right. Uh, unfortunately, a cache saw this happen. So the cache saw someone try and get this image, which is on the website's homepage, and then they see the redirect to my server coming as the response. <laughs> and then they save it, and then for several days, anyone that goes to the homepage of that site ends up trying to fetch this image from my server, and I, get, and I get quite stressed out. Uh, so if we just hijacked a JavaScript file there, we would have taken full control over, over that website. We could hijack the account of anyone that went to that homepage with no, user in, with no user interaction. So on the one hand here, I've shown how easy it is to do cache poisoning with, <laughs> with request smuggling. It's so easy that you can do it by accident. But on the other hand, it's not really something you want to happen by accident. Uh, so we need to think about how we're going to stop this from happening, or at least reduce the chance of it happening. One way of doing that is to try and craft a prefix that triggers, triggers a response that has anti-caching headers. And, uh, and another is that if you've got a choice of, of front ends, like you will have if the front end server is just, is just part of a CDN, uh, try and target a front end in a geographic region that's either that's remote or sleep and is therefore not getting much traffic and thereby that increases the chance that you'll win the race and you'll get the poisoned response rather than some random other person browsing the website. So that was bad, uh, but that left me wondering what happens if we <laughs> embrace this possibility. So here I've smuggled a request that's saying please fetch me my API key. And it, and when some el someone else's request gets concatenated onto that, it will be completed with that cookie, which means it'll be completed in their session, and it will fetch that other user's API key. And that user will receive their API key, which is fine, it's their own key, uh, which is harmless. But if a cache sees that happening, and the user was actually trying to fetch some static resource, that user's key ends up being saved in the cache, and then we can just go and grab it. The, uh, if this technique sounds kind of familiar, uh, that's because it's basically just a variation of the web cache deception technique. Uh, the key difference being that this technique doesn't require any user interaction. You're just exploiting a random person browsing the website and you can do it over and over. There's also a small catch, which is that as the attacker, you've got no control over where this user's API key lands on the site. It's just going to land on a random <coughs> static file, and you're going to have to like browse all of them in order to find it. Uh, 
So this is the only technique in these slides where I wasn't able to find a live example of it. Uh, that's because you have to log into a site to find this kind of content. And my pipeline that I use to scan to find these, <laughs> these examples doesn't log in, but I'm pretty sure it's out there. And that's roughly the location I would expect you to find it. Now, on New Relic, we saw that their backend was an internal proxy. But some other websites take things one step further and they decide to chain the CDN onto a CDN. Uh, I saw Akamai chained onto Cloudflare, uh, which is insane. But I couldn't exploit that. But these guys had chained Akamai onto Akamai. Uh, I've no idea how or why. But the end result is, if I change the host header in the smuggled request, then I can get the response from anywhere, any website, any page on any website on the Akamai network. And the front end Akamai is happy to save that. So I can basically overwrite their homepage with any content from any website on the Akamai network. Now, while looking at redhat.com itself, I found it was vulnerable to request smuggling and I was looking for a vulnerability to chain with it. And I found this DOM-based open redirect. And this raised an interesting challenge because with, with request smuggling, we control the URL that the backend server thinks the user is on, but we don't con control the URL in the victim's web browser. So when this get, get query param function is executed in JavaScript in the victim's web browser, that's running on a URL we don't control and we can't exploit them. <laughs> but by finding a local redirect on the target site, there's a server-side redirect, I was able to take control of that URL and basically chain that with the DOM-based redirect to send them to an arbitrary location. Uh, so this is a generic technique that, uh, that you can use to make it any kind of DOM-based issue exploitable. Now, we've seen local redirects can be useful, but actually quite a few things that are normally local redi redirects turn into open redirects in the presence of request smuggling. So on this site, uh, it's got a very common behavior that's a default behavior in Apache and some versions of IIS, which is if you try and access a folder without a trailing slash, they'll give you a helpful redirect to put the slash on. And when they do that, the host part of that redirect is populated using the host header. Now, this technique is really predictable. It's really easy. And if you can redirect a JavaScript file, you can hijack accounts. And if you can get that cached, you can hijack everyone's account. So this became my kind of go-to technique for exploiting this for, for exploiting this vulnerability. And I got quite a few separate bounties with it. Now, there's a couple of points worth mentioning. Uh, if you get a 307 redirect to your arbitrary location, that's wonderful. Because if a browser is doing a post request, let's say it's trying to log someone in by submitting their username and password, and it gets a 307 redirect, it will resend that data to the new website. So someone's browser, they'll be trying to log in, and then their browser will just send their password to you in plain text, which is fantastic. Also, it's worth mentioning that some thick, some thick, thick clients like non-browser-based HTTP libraries will, will also ha have this data reposting on arbitrary status codes rather than just 307. So on New Relic, they had some kind of API-based command line uh, client thing, and that was happy to resend its credentials even though it, I was just using a 301 redirect. So one of the targets this redirect-based cache poisoning stuff worked on uh, was PayPal which is awesome. So here, if we try and if we send a URL that looked like this, they would respond with a redirect containing my domain. Uh, there were a couple of catches here. One is that my domain would, would, would get concatenated with the domain from the victim's host header, but that was easily worked around by sticking a question mark at the end of the host header. Uh, the other problem is a slightly bigger problem, which is that this redirect is being done using HTTP rather than HTTPS. And that means that this redirect is a risk of getting blocked by browser's mixed content protections. Uh, but there are ways to bypass that in Safari and Edge and IE, which I don't have time to talk about here, but they're in my resource presentation from last year. So we can exploit people with this using 
as long as they're using Safari or Edge or IE, and PayPal had a cache. So we could persistently hijack this JavaScript file, and it was being used on PayPal's sign-in page. Unfortunately, there was a catch, which is PayPal's sign-in page also uses CSP, which would block that redirect. Uh, but I wasn't going to give up there, not on PayPal's sign-in page. And I noticed that their sign-in page also loads a different domain inside an iframe. And this URL was on c.paypal.com, and it also loads my Poison JavaScript file, and it doesn't have CSP. So that means I can hijack that iframe. But I can't just read the user's password out of the parent page because the same origin policy would block that because I'm not on the same domain. But my colleague Gareth Hayes spotted paypal.com slash us slash gifts, which was a static page on PayPal. And it didn't use CSP. And it did import my malicious JavaScript file. So I could first hijack the iframe on c.paypal.com and then redirect the iframe to paypal.com slash us slash gifts, re-hijack it on that domain, and then I was same domain with the parents, so I could just grab the user's PayPal password and send it off to my website, uh, and I got a $19,000 bounty for that. Thank you. So PayPal fixed this issue by making their front end, which was Akamai, block any requests that had the word chunked in the transfer encoding header. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was like, well, well they, they asked me, like, James, do you think this is secure? And I kind of spent like half, half a day on it. And I was like, yeah, seems perfectly solid to me. Uh, oh, dear. <laughs> but then a couple of weeks later, I decided to try out using line wrapping to try and desynchronize servers. And I didn't really think this was going to work on anything uh, because line wrapping is completely valid as per the RFC. And yet, it didn't work on anything directly. But what it did do was make the word chunked invisible to Akamai. So they, they let the, the, the request through. I could once again hijack PayPal's login page <laughs> and got another $20,000 bounty, which was really generous given it was kind of my fault in the first place. <laughs> so at this point, we've seen a whole range of different attacks you can do with request smuggling. Now it's time to attend the live demo and see what happens. So this is a replica of a real system. It's pretty much an exact replica. So this is Bugzilla. Uh, this typically holds lots of juicy browser zero days that are not visible to the public. And so I, I'm going to take the request to the home page. I'm going to right click on it and, and click launch smuggle probe. So that option is there because of this open source extension that I've installed. And here we can see all the desynchronization techniques uh, that, it, that it supports. I've turned them all off apart from the one that's actually going to work, so I'm just going to set that running. And now if we look at Flow, which is not part of this extension, but is also free in the App Store, we can see what my extension is actually doing behind the scenes. So you can see it's using this timeout technique that I showed you at the start. And this message is ambiguous. It's causing desynchronization because of this header here. So if we look at the hex view, it's probably too small to see. Uh, but this, the, the, the ending of this line ends with 0a, whereas every other line ends with 0d0a. So what that means is that the front end server thinks that this whole thing is one header and falls back to using the, uh, the content length. Whereas the backend system sees that as being a valid line ending and thereby thinks this message is chunked, which means we can desynchronize it, which is why we're getting this timeout. So in theory, if I browse to the uh, target pane, we'll now see it's found this vulnerability. Maybe. Fantastic. Uh, so and it's attached the evidence showing that it sent this request and it got a timeout. So now if I right click on this request, we've got an extra option, which is smuggle attack. This pops open a turbo intruder window, and it, you don't need to worry about any of the content here except this prefix variable. So this is the malicious prefix that will get a, that will get, that will get applied to the next request, uh, and the tool will automatically fix up all the offsets and such like for you, which is absolutely horrific to, to do manually. So here we're going to try and make the second request to hit the server 
get 44. And if I send that, hopefully, yeah, sure enough, we can see we got a 404 here. Even though this is identical to this request and that got a 200, because of the smuggled content, this got a 404. So you can see the smuggled content uh, just here. See? So that proves that this system is vulnerable to request smuggling. Uh, but we just want to prove that you can actually do some damage with it, right? So on Bugzilla, anyone can register an account and file a bug. And on a bug, they can put an attachment, and the attachment can contain HTML. But this is actually safe, because if you look here, this site is on bmoweb.vm, but as soon as I try and load a suspicious attachment, I end up on bmosandbox.vm, which means that the malicious JavaScript I've got there doesn't actually work because of the same origin policy. Uh, so that by itself is completely harmless, but maybe we can take advantage of that behavior. So I'm going to take the request to load that attachment from BMO sandbox.vm and I'm going to use that as my malicious prefix here. So it's important to leave this xignore header on the end because the victim's request is going to get stuck directly like on there, like like that, and if that lands on the host header, then it will just break the request. So now, the second request to hit the server should get a different response, and as you can see, this contains some suspicious JavaScript. So now, in order to prove this works for real, all I'm going to do is I'm going to send that payload, but I'm not going to send the fake victim follow-up request. So I'm going to leave the backend socket poisoned. And that means that, in theory, Whoever else is browsing the site, whatever they click, it doesn't matter. They're going to get my exploit back, and it's going to steal their password. Uh, and I got uh, roughly $9,000 for that one, uh, which takes the total to roughly 75 k which is the full amount earned in this research so far. So, how do you prevent this? Well, firstly, you can't prevent it unless you can find it, and that means you need to be careful what tools you're using. In particular, make sure that your tool doesn't automatically fix the content length, because that will prevent you from finding half of these vulnerabilities. And also, some tools, uh, particularly curl, will normalize malformed requests, and once again, that will make things look secure when they're not. Also, some companies like to force pen testers to use a proxy. And if you've got pen testers using a proxy and we, real and users, normal users accessing the site directly, that's terrible because those because the, the proxy will mangle their payloads. The pen testers won't find the real vulnerabilities, and they and it may actually introduce extra vulnerabilities that can only be used to hack other pen testers. So as far as preventing this go, goes, the ideal is to have the front end system exclusively use HTTP two to to talk to backends. Uh, I believe HTTP2 has built-in uh, defenses against this kind of stuff. But that's probably not very realistic for everyone, so the next best option is to have the front end rewrite and normalize any kind of ambiguous <coughs> messages. Uh, this approach is backed up by the more modern RFCs. If you're forced to try and uh, to, to try and prevent this by changing the backend system, you should make it just drop any ambiguous requests and also drop the connection so the subsequent messages aren't poisoned. There's loads of further reading on this topic. Uh, probably the most noteworthy thing is this year we've released a whole bunch of online labs so you can test out real live systems that are, that are vulnerable to these techniques in relative safety and kind of get familiar with the vulnerability for yourself. The three key things to take away are that HTTP request smuggling is real. It doesn't matter how scary it is, it definitely exists. HTTP 1.1 parsing is a security critical function and it should always be audited in, uh, in web servers. And if you're using some kind of obscure web server, you should be really careful. And finally, detection doesn't have to be dangerous. I'm going to take five minutes of questions now, maybe, just about. Uh, yep, cool. And if you have any more after that, just come and speak to me at the back or send me an email. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter. Thank you for listening.
anyone has a question, put your hand up and I'll bring the mic over. Hi, thanks James. Uh, there's a sort of implication this is like implementation dependence. So I'm assuming one of your outcomes from this was enumerating which sort of servers behave in different ways that maybe you were going to make public? Um, no, that's not my approach to finding these examples. Basically, I've got a bird project file and it has every single bug bounty swipe in it. And then I'm just like, select all, right click, scan with my extension. So a lot of the vulnerable systems, I've got no idea what they're running. Uh, often it's quite hard to tell what the front end system is, is running. I, I think they don't really advertise themselves. Uh, there are some systems that I know were vulnerable, uh, but some of them I, I, I can't name. Others like Akamai and F5, I can. Your best bet is just to test whatever your, set, whatever your setup is. Okay, anyone else? If not, then um, a big round of applause for James. Thank you very much. Thank you.